Hi, and welcome to this video. Today I would like to talk a little bit about Swift Data and Codable, and specifically, how you can make your Swift Data models codable. It's not uncommon for applications to take data from a remote server and then have a desire to put this remote data somewhere locally. You could cache this in a flat file cache, you could put stuff in user defaults, but historically speaking, there are people that like to store these responses and the models that they get from a remote server in core data. I have a blog post up on my website where I talk about making core data models codable, but I figured I'd also want to show you how to make a Swift data model codable. Now, to do that, let's start by defining a simple model um, right here in this Xcode project that I have open. And what we'll do is write that simple model, make it a Swift data model, and then conform it to Codable. So I'll start off by defining a new class uh, called movie. And our movie is going to have two properties. Uh, we're gonna keep the model nice and small because there's really no point in adding a dozen properties to this if that doesn't really change the point of what I'm trying to show you here. All right, so we'll add an original title and a release date, which will be of type string. Um, that's just because I know that the remote fake remote server that I'll be using for this post is going to give me dates of strings. So if you're defining your own model, please, please, please use proper types. Um, we'll add an initializer for our object. And that's all we need, all right? This is a very simple class that I can now add codable to, let's call it codable. And we built the project and everything is good or rather it should be good. Uh, probably, yeah should comment that for now. And if we look at the model now, everything is good. Okay, so that's a very simple codable model. Now let's make this a Swift data class by adding the model uh, macro to it. And we can instantly see that we get a compiler error. And that error is type movie does not conform to protocol decodable, and it also doesn't conform to protocol encodable. So that's not good. Um, and what happens here is that this, this macro that we have runs before the compiler tries to synthesize our codable implementation, right? Codable, and I'll, I'll put a link somewhere up on the screen or whatever um, to, to teach you more about codable because I have a whole guide on my website. But codable is a protocol that the compiler will synthesize to some implementations for. Specifically, it will add an initializer that allows us to decode data into our movies, and it adds an encode function that allows us to encode movie instances into data. And that runs after the macro runs. And one of the requirements for codable or for decodable and encodable is that it can only be synthesized if all of the members on a class or struct are also codable. Now, before we added this model macro, our two strings are codable. That's something that happens out of the box. But when we added this macro, and if we expand the macro using Xcode, we can see that there are now other properties added, right? We still have our original properties, and these are also wrapped in macros. And you don't have to understand everything this code does uh, because it's just not that interesting to know all that. But we can also see that we have this private variable backing data, any Swift data backing data, right? And, and this probably isn't codable. And we have a bunch of other things here. And having these other things, that's why we cannot synthesize protocol conformance anymore, because none of these added properties by the macro are codable. All right, so we can go on ahead and close all this out. So what can we do to make our object codable? And sadly, there is, is no, no magic that I want to show you today. Uh, the approach is actually to manually make your object codable. So we can define coding keys, right? And we'll add some cases for them, original title, and we'll add case release date. And first we'll just make this uh, object decodable. Right, so we're going to add an initializer from decoder. We'll say let container equals try decoder 
container key by coding keys dot self. This will get us a container that we can extract data from. And then we'll say self dot original title equals try container dot decode string dot self, right? Because that's the type that we want to get out for key dot original title. And we'll follow this exact same pattern for the release date because that's also a string in our case. And this is all that we need for our custom decoder. If I had more properties, I would need to define more of these lines of code. And that's also why I kept it to two so that this could be nice and small. Now we only get one compiler error, which is that we're not encodable. So let's go ahead and fix that. We can add our encode to function. We can make a container. In this case, we need the container to be a variable. Uh, and we don't need to try to make a container. We will always succeed in doing that in this case. And now we'll say try container.encode, uh, the value that we're looking for, which is going to be original title, for key original title, try container.encode release date, for key release date. Right? And that's our custom encoding logic in place. Now I did prepare uh, some testing code for this. So let's go ahead and uncomment un all of this right here so that we have our code set up. Uh, we don't have this property yet. We will add it later because we're going to look at relationships in this video as well. Our code builds, right? That's great. Uh, just kind of looking at what we have here, the interesting part for us is this, right? To, if we fetch data from the network like we did here, we can decode that into our movie object now. And we can do that using our plain old uh, init from decoder. After decoding, we do need to make sure that we register our movies with the context that we want to use, right? The model context that we want to use. So that's in the environment right here. Um, we, we get it from our abstract and we insert our movies into the context. Everything is handled with auto saves and all that stuff in Swift UI, so that's great. So let's go on ahead and run this and see if that all works as expected. Simulator is nice and quick, I like it. Of course the launch is a little bit slower, but that's fine. Right, so we'll kind of just let this go for a little bit and as we do this, I want to talk about relationships. We'll check back up, we actually just got here. All right, so we have a bunch of data in here and we can go in ahead and load more and we beautifully get more data in here. So that's good, right? All of this uh, works for every object that we get from the network. It's the same movie every time, I know. Um, we can click load more and it's decoded and persisted and added to our model context. So that's great. Does this get more complicated when we have relationships? And the answer is not really, but maybe a little bit, All right? So let us define a relationship. Uh, we're gonna use the relationship macro for that. I don't have any options to give. I just have a delete rule that I want to pass, which is going to be cascade. Whenever we delete the movie, we want to delete whatever relationship I'm about to define. I'm gonna say var cast and it'll be of type actor, not the actor from Swift and Currency, the actor from actual movies. All right, and we'll actually just go ahead and expand our initializer so that we get some nice properties. Actor and then self.cast equals cast. Okay, so that's how we do that. Oops, a little typo there. Okay, that's good. Now let's go on ahead and define our at model class actor. And we're gonna make that codable too. Right, so it's gonna be the same thing as before. We're not going to make this any more complicated than it needs to be. We'll only have a single property here, by the way, so it's gonna be let name of type string, right? Again, you get the point, if I would add 10 properties, it would just be me doing 10, uh, the same thing 10 times, which is boring for everybody. So we're gonna define another enum coding keys, which will confirm to the coding key protocol, case name for just our name property. We'll get uh, the default initializer, so we can make actors without codable, and we'll get the decoder in it. And I'll just go ahead and copy paste my container code here. Try right, to obtain a container from the coding keys. And then I'll say self.name equals try container.decode 
string dot self for key name. My encode logic, right? It's going to be very similar to what I had before. So I'm going to go ahead and copy paste my container obtaining code and I'm going to try container dot encode name for key name. Right? This is very boilerplatey. Uh, it's very repetitive. And the only reason we have to do this is because the compiler cannot do this due to the model macro. It would be great if at some point we get a different macro or some sort of extension on uh, codable or whatever that would allow us to define uh, our codable protocol and not have to do boilerplate ourselves. Uh, in Swift data, we of course work with um, inverse relationships. So let's also add the inverse for our actor here. So the delete rule is going to be nullify, right? If we delete one of the actors or cast members, we don't want to delete the movie. We just want to kind of null out the reference on the other side. And uh, this will be a let movies and its type will be movie, right? And we can actually add this to our init right here. Self movies equal movie. Now note that I'm not going to decode movies in my require init from decoder. The reason I'm not doing that is because Swift data will actually make sure that uh, whenever we fetch movies from the database or whenever we fetch actors from the database, both ends of this relationship are populated. And my goal here is to decode a response that's given to me by a server. Now, if the server would have movies and lists of actors and each actor has a reference back to the movie, then the movie would have that list of actors and it would infinitely recurse. Uh, we don't want that. So when decoding, we, we follow the structure of the JSON that we're decoding. And in this case, that's um, a list of actors where each actor only has a name property. And right? so it doesn't point back to movies at all. Now, to make this code here work, there's one more thing that we need to do. We need to say self dot cast equals try container dot decode. And we need to expand our coding keys before we do this. Like that, decode actor dot self or array of actor dot self uh, for key dot cast. And we also have to update our encoding logic to try container dot encode the cast for key dot cast. Okay. So now we can compile this and we can actually uncomment this line right here to actually see that we're fetching cast members as expected. So let's go ahead and build the project, All right? We see that everybody has zero cast members because that's our existing data. But if I click this load more, we're going to go to the network and that one gets 15 cast members, All right? And if we relaunch the app now to see that everything worked, the last couple still have 15 cast members. The reason all of these have zero is because I fetched them or persisted them without actually decoding their cast members at all. And for these last couple, I did and uh, decode the cast members. So that's really the trick to all of this. Um, there is no magic. There is no synthesized code. You have to do the boilerplate yourself. And you want to think about uh, relationships and not doing infinite recursion. Uh, just closely follow your JSON model, really. That's uh, what this is all about. So do you really need codable for Swift data objects? And the answer is you, you need half of it, right? We typically don't need encode. Uh, I talked in the beginning of this video about doing uh, sort of a local cache using Swift data. If that's what you're using it for, you only need decoding logic. You don't have to have encoding logic. So we could totally get rid of the encode functionality right here. And instead of using codable, we can use decodable, right? Because making something decodable allows us to take data from a network and take it from there, right? So that's probably what you'll be using in practice. I did want to also show you encodable or rather the full suite of codable. So that includes encodable just so that you've seen both of them. Um, this is certainly a lot easier than it was with uh, core data where in core data we needed to pass around the managed object context, which luckily we don't have to do now. It's just a little bit of a shame that we have to write our own coding keys and our own required in it from decoder and our own func encode. Um, that just feels like boilerplate to me. I, I really hope that at some point uh, we can stop doing that. So that would be 
great if that happens. Uh, what's also fun or really nice is that when we insert our movies into the context, all of the actors that we encoded alongside our movies are automatically inserted too, so we don't have to loop through the movie's cast and insert every individual actor, so that's kind of nice. Um, there is one issue with the setup that I have right here that I do want to call out, which is this only works if you don't have um, a setup where you fetch a movie from your API or from your remote server, and then you decode an actor for that movie. And then at a later point in time, you might have a situation where you get a different movie with the same actor in it, right? If you run into that, you will have to handle that appropriately, uh, probably by passing a model context through your user defaults for your codable. Um, that's not going to be too pretty. It's a topic for another video. I really just wanted to cover the basics for now and probably do a follow-up with sort of an advanced sort of um, find or insert kind of logic on decoded models. For now, thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day and I'll see you again in the next video. Thanks.